going to record this for my mystery channel, Mystery Unsolved Crime channel, and, and I'm going to post it on the mob site. So for you mob followers, uh, a lot of what I have to go over is going to be elementary stuff, so just bear with it for a little while. Uh, I'm also going to post this on the, Chicago, on the Boston mob site. And again, I know it's simple stuff, but the people who are on the uh, the other channel, the mystery channel, don't follow mob stuff. So I have to go over some of this slowly. This is an ama it's called a murder in Sebring. And it, it is, a reporter said, and she's right, akin to a, a 1940s film noir thing. It, it's mystery. It's just bizarre. This is guy, Johnny the Duke Sweet. Uh, he was a bookie, a counterfeiter, drug smuggler, pimp, you name it. Uh, in Roxbury, he aligned himself with the Bennett boys. The, the Bennett's were an old line uh, Irish gangster group in Roxbury, Massachusetts. They weren't part of the mafia, uh, but they, they had a lockdown on Roxbury, and just about everything bad you could do, they had a piece of it. Sweet, who had this very, very strong Boston accent, moved to Sebring, Florida in 1964. He didn't really fit in. He was just, uh, Sebring was much smaller then than it is today. He wore this enormous flashy diamond ring on his pinky, and it, he, he dressed like a gangster. He ran poker and dice games in the Elks Club in Sebring on Friday nights, but he also had a broker's license. He was heavily involved with real estate. He was married, and as far as I can figure out, he was separated from his wife, but I, I can't, I couldn't verify that. So he meets, he's in Sebring, he meets this woman, Irene Maxey, who's her own piece of work, in 1964. They start to have an affair. She's a married woman. Uh, Mr. Maxey, her husband, apparently knew about this affair, but he tolerated it. It came out later on that he tolerated it, probably, because he had a slew of his own affairs going on. So Sweet, the semi-gangster, and Irene, they think it's best that they kill Irene's husband, who's a very wealthy rancher, and I, in this serenio they'll kill him and they'll collect his estate and live happily ever after as her widow. So <laughs> at the trial, however, that would come in a few years, uh, Irene said that the murder thing was completely Sweet's idea, which I, I agree with, uh, and that he tried to convince her that her husband was going to divorce her. He's going to leave her penniless. So the thing to do is kill him now and get all the estate money. Uh, that way they could all be together and live happily ever after. The estate at the time was valued at 500 acres of citrus groves. So that had its own fortune. And overall, around $10 million is what they figure he was worth. Irene was an Alabama native uh, who met Maxie while she was working at a fruit picker in one of his groves. The marriage just shocked the family. Uh, the, the family was third generation wealthy. Um, the friends didn't know what, Maxie's friends couldn't figure out what this guy was doing. Irene, on the other hand, came from a dirt poor family. Uh, she barely had a seventh grade education. She was crude. She was rude, kind of foul mouth. But uh, she had what men wanted. She was really sexy. Uh, she had kind of an edge to her. Um, that's what he saw in her, I guess. So Charles Van Maxey, her husband, he was completely different. As I said, third generation wealthy, graduate Washington Lee in Virginia, which was has a it's a tough program in Washington. Uh, he owned the citrus groves, and he also had in two counties, and he also had cattle ranches and personal investments. Johnny Sweet, the boyfriend now goes back to Boston, and he gets back in touch with Willie Walter Bennett, one of the three Bennett brothers. And he says, look, I need you to kill this guy, Maxie, for me. Here's 30 grand. So Walter Bennett, he says, all right, I can do that. He contacts this guy he's got named Billy Garraway. Garraway is a lifelong criminal. He's a self, these are his words, self-proclaimed monument to failure. He claimed to have been convicted 102 times for various crimes, and he was under indictment for two murders. The under indictment for two murders was true. Uh, he did all this, he said, before the age of 32. So Garraway said he knew Walter Bennett, of course, and he knew John Sweet from back up in Boston. Uh, he knew Sweet when Sweet was doing bookie work. So Garraway said Walter Bennett came to him in April of 1966, 
and he asked him if he put a hit on this guy who he called just called Maxi again that would be the husband in Florida that he'd get five grand cash uh, and then after the hit he'd get some more money too and he had to go get all this from Sweet who he knew down in Florida who would fill him in on the details so Garraway says well I don't know why are we killing this guy and Walter Bennett says, because it's a thing about romance. And Gary said, well, why don't you just get a divorce? And to which Bennett said, these people are worth a lot of money to us, uh, Billy. It's going to be an easy buck for you. Garraway said, this I don't believe, he said this in court. I declined. I said I was a check passer, not a killer. So Bennett and Sweet hired uh, this guy, Andrew Van Etter. Um, he was a killer, though. He was under indictment for two killings. Um, but he said this in court, and what, why that's important is he connected Sweet to the Bennett family back up in Boston. So this guy they got, Andrew Von Etter, was really a piece of work. He was called a baron, sarcastically. He was tied in with Wimpy Bennett, Walter Bennett's brother. Wimpy ran the gang. Call him Wimpy. From this, he always had a hamburger at this place, and if you're probably too young to know this, there was a cartoon character, a Popeye, Wimpy. And I will gladly pay you tomorrow for a hamburger today if he would say that. So that's where that came from. But trust me on this, people. Wimpy Bennett was no character from a cartoon. This guy was dangerous. All three brothers ended up dead. Really, uh, two of them have never been found. So. Uh, Associated with, by the way, with Van Etter was Jimmy the Bear Fleming and Stephen the Rifleman Fleming, two really, really bad guys. Van Etter was born in Lithuania. He said uh, his grandfather was, a great-grandfather was General Sebastian Van Etter, a distinguished fighter in the 1871 Russo-Turkish War, and that his father was of German nobility. He immigrated to the U.S. in 1947, but by 1962, he, Van Etter is a full-blown gangster. He was arrested in 62. He was a security guard at a company, and he discovered the safe, so, you know, he robbed it. Uh, Von Etter was murdered, uh, Von Etter, rather, I'm sorry, murdered Maxi on October 3, 1966, as Maxi laid in his bedroom. The killers, there may have been two, threw a sheet, threw a sheet over his head, stabbed him four times, and shot him in the head. Maxi, when they murdered this guy, he was 41 years old. Since the affair between Johnny Sweet and Irene was known all over the place, uh, the police were already investigating this, and they pretty much had a sketch of what was going on. They knew that Sweet was tied in with Irene, that Sweet was tied in with the Boston mob, so the murder starts to fall apart very quickly, mostly because of what Sweet did. A couple of weeks after the murder, he flies with, to Boston uh, to pay off the $15,000 balance. Then he comes back to Irene and he says, Look, the gangsters want more money. Uh, so I could, they keep charging me for this. I'm being blackmailed. You need to give me more money, uh, $75,000 more. And Irene said, no, I'm not going to give you $75,000 more. So he threatens Irene, and he threatens her five-year-old five girl. She's terrified, as well she should be, and goes to the cops and says, look, this is what happens. And so for implicating Sweet in this murder-for-hire scheme, she's going to get immunity. Uh, by then, there had, as I said, a comprehensive police investigation was really making a lot of grounds. They knew pretty much what was going on. For one thing, they investigated, uh, they talked rather to a woman named Kay Carter, who said she met Von Etter and a man named William Kelly at around the time the murder happened, a day or two within the, the murder happened, at the Daytona Inn Motel, where the prosecution says these two hitmen uh, stayed before they drove out and killed Maxie. As this investigation, I'm skipping ahead now, but as this investigation goes closer and closer uh, to Walter Bennett, all of the Bennett boys were paranoid schizophrenics. I mean, they were just, they wouldn't get in a car with anyone they didn't know. They carried weapons all the time, loaded weapons. They were really careful. You know, uh, Wimpy Bennett, the older brother, covered his mouth whenever he spoke in public and in private. And what he did was to find out what other gangsters were doing. He hired lip readers. And they'd read the lips and then come back and tell him what was said. So these guys were careful. And it looks like uh, Van Etter's going to go going to get locked up for this murder. 
even because the cops, this is, by now it's 1960, they, they knew who Van Etter was, and they had his name, and they had Billy Kelly's name. Um, so Bennett figures, why, you know, why risk it? And he takes Van Etter out, kills him, dumps him in a car. Uh, a few months later, Walter Bennett himself is killed. So Irene Maxey, she's done time in prison, she's five years, because she perjured herself during the first trial. Her testimony was erratic, it was weird, it was difficult to follow. She denied, even under protection of immunity, that she wanted to kill her husband. And the cops had, and the prosecutors had all this evidence that she really wanted this guy dead. She testified the whole thing was Sweet's idea. She claimed to have witnessed uh, the phone calls he made, the arrangements, all that stuff. Uh, he kept her filled in, and she gave him $35,000. She said that to help pay for the murder. And again, this all went sour when he came back and wanted another 75000 Sweet was arrested in 1967, and he's charged with first-degree murder in this thing for killing Mr. Maxey. Sweet starts out by denying everything in court. Instead, what he... Think about how smart this was, a long-term thing. He knew he was guilty. So what he did was, he he, for, he said that she plotted everything, that she gave him water once to put into the gas tank at her husband's plane so it would crash. But then he went after her personally. He said, look, you know, she's uh, she sent me nude pictures of herself. She seduced a teenage boy uh, at her home. She tried to have sex with a collie a pet dog that he bought her, sending nude pictures for the young people. In 1964, it was a big deal. You had to go out, take a camera, take a picture, find somebody crazy enough to develop it for you because you could get arrested for trying to develop that sort of stuff. It was completely different than it is today, uh, which means if you send someone a nude photo of yourself, you really had some sort of problem, you know, sex thing going on. So he really damaged her that way. And listen, but you'll learn why in a minute. So the first trial ends in a hung jury. He was convicted, Sweet was convicted in the second trial, he sends it to life in prison. But Sweet and his attorneys, they used this loophole thing to get through. Here's what they did. They tried to introduce a claim that Irene had sex with the chief investigator in the case. It was a lie, but who cares? So the judge looked it over and he thought, well, he probably is a lie, but... It's much too inflammatory. This is 1964. The world's a different place. And he's not going to allow the jury to hear that. And there was no, no, no way to substantiate it. It was just, you know, this sort of uh, giving someone a black eye in court goes on, my God, every day. And I think he just thought, this, this is a little loose. I don't know. So a year later, so he didn't allow it. A year later, the appeals court says, well, that judge was wrong. It should have been allowed. The jury should have heard what was going on. And Sweet, remarkably, gets to have another case. But he was never retried. Uh, so basically, he walked. Now, he, he would have been, it would have been difficult to retry him anyway. The reason the state dropped the case is, while the, after the second case ended, the state, who knows why, took most of the evidence uh, clothing, the bullet used in the case, the bloody sheet used to strangle this guy, uh, his shirt, the victim's shirt, and everything, and they destroyed it. So at that point, they just thought, you know, the hell, let, let this guy go. So he got away with murder. During the trial, police did learn that the suspected killers were Von Etter and this guy, William Billy Kelly. They weren't arrested because they had the names, but they had no evidence. They had no hardcore evidence. And it just wouldn't have gone anywhere. It was pointless. Then, so many years go by. By the way, the the estate, the Maxi estate, eventually fell apart. Um, Irene goes off. She's living in poverty. In 1981, Sweet had cut a deal with the Massachusetts State Police. He's been arrested, and he says, "Look, uh, it was a, I was involved with a drug deal that went bad." Uh, but I want you to know the guys involved with the drug deal with Billy Kelly is threatening to kill me. And he says, so what I'll do is I'll pin Kelly to the murder of Maxie down in Florida in 1964. I'll testify. And the cop said, well, you never brought it up before. Well, he said, well I, I've changed my mind. 
It wasn't Van Etter. It was Kelly. Kelly's the killer here. And I'm going to testify that in court. And you get yourself a murder conviction. But I want all the charges against me dropped. And I want to go into the witness protection program. Remarkably, the cops agreed to that. So Billy Kelly, he's six foot two. He was a suspected murderer. There was a theory that he had killed this businessman, George Hamilton. Hamilton's business partners got together. They said, look, go kill Hamilton for us. We'll collect his insurance. We'll pay you from that. Kelly was also a regular at Walter's Lounge, which was run by the Bennett brothers back in Boston. Uh, but again, just to remind you, by that time, the Bennetts or all the mafias killed the Bennett brothers. So Sweet testifies against Kelly. In exchange, this is what the cops dropped. Uh, he, he got a sweet deal. He was arrested for counterfeiting, prostitution, narcotics distribution, arson, bribery, um, loan sharking, counterfeiting with intent, I don't know what that means, hijacking, and suspicion of murder. They dropped it all. So he goes down to Florida. He says, yeah, Kelly's the guy. And, blah, blah, blah. and Kelly is now having to defend himself. And Sweet walks away free. He get, enters the witness protection program. Uh, Kelly, in court, he admitted to being involved in this drug deal with Sweet in the early 1980s, 1980 rather. So Sweet, uh, he said, cheated him. And he agreed. Yeah, he made threats about the Sweet. He said he was going to kill him, blah, blah, blah. And but he didn't uh, wasn't involved with this uh, murder in Florida. Now much of what Kelly said about his activities up in Boston with Sweet are it's a matter of public record. He wasn't lying about any of that. They arrested the FBI. How he got arrested? The FBI was looking for him in another case, and they caught him in a motel room in Tampa in 1984. Eighteen years have passed since the Von, since the Macy murder. So he's on trial. Uh, in 1983, he's defended by William Kunstler. For those of you who are too young to know, William Kunstler in the late 60s, early 70s, was this radical, really well-known defense lawyer. But he was political, right? In Chicago 7, he defended them. He was. Uh, I met him briefly um, <laughs> with, my, uh, with my father. Uh, my father sold antiques occasionally. And uh, Kunstler lived up in Connecticut, I think, part-time. Um, my father was an arch conservative, and so he had no idea who the hell counselor was. But anyway, they get a uh, counselor made a remark, and oh, my God. anyway, he was radical, and he defended Raymond Patriarca, who ran the, the mob up in Providence, and he defended John uh, Gotti, a lot of other people actually. He was a good lawyer, but not in this case. Well, maybe he was a good lawyer in this case. It doesn't matter because, you know, Kelly pretty much. Um, you know, he had all the guilty stuff around him. My only question is, uh, if Walter Bennett, who was, as I said, a paranoid, killed Von Etter because he thought Von Etter could tie me into this thing, why didn't he kill Kelly, too? You know, I mean, he knew who Kelly was. He knew where he could find him. Murdering him would came easy to the Bennetts, but they didn't kill him. So he left a, a, one end loose. It isn't something that the brothers did. Uh, anyway, he was sentenced to death row in April of 1984. As of 2023, as of this morning, I checked, he's still on death row. Uh, he maintains to, to this day that he didn't meet Sweet until 1970, and he had nothing to do with the murder. Irene uh, and Charles Maxey's, who was Charles Maxey's uh, daughter, Irene and, and Charles Maxey's daughter, is now friends with Billy Kelly, the guy who kills her father. Uh, they write to each other. She's made several attempts to have him taken off death row. There is no death penalty, apparently, in Florida now, uh, but he's still on death row. I don't get that. To this day, as I said, he, he said he had nothing to do with the murder. Irene Johnson, the woman, she died in December 27, 2007, poor. And Sweet died of cancer in 19, 